So things are not perfect and pristine in the high tunnel tomato beds anymore. Um, I knew it would just be a matter of time before there would be issues in here. Obviously, uh, building the high tunnel kind of pushed back some of those issues, whereas in the front, we've already started to deal with a pretty good amount of yellow spot because of all of the rain and moisture. I would say the tomatoes back here definitely look better than the ones in the front, so the high tunnel is doing its job but uh, they're starting to have some issues. And I just wanted to share it with you guys today, kind of talk to you about some of the issues that I'm seeing and what I'm gonna do about them. If you happen to spot this ripe tomato sitting here on the corner, I actually just picked this up in the front garden because I was gonna take it inside and eat it for breakfast. None of the tomatoes in the high tunnel have ripened yet. I see several that I feel like are probably pretty close and I think I'll probably be harvesting tomatoes out of here in a, in a week or so. I am already harvesting some peppers and I have some eggplants down on the end that are, that are getting pretty close, I think, to producing. And then we have ground cherries that are already ripening. So when you start growing a garden, you're gonna learn pretty quick that there are just some issues that come along with trying to domesticate and cultivate plants like in a controlled sense. You're gonna end up with pest pressure, um, you're gonna end up with disease in some cases, and uh, it can be kind of devastating whenever you're working really hard and sometimes those things, the pest pressure and the disease, uh, lead to losing your plants or cutting back into your harvest. Definitely wise to troubleshoot, um, figure out what it is that's going on and figure out the best way to combat it. But what I have found with a lot of gardeners that do have a lot of experience, uh, they definitely take those steps to try to to fight those bugs and prevent those diseases and all of that and you, you take all of those steps but then at some point you kind of just roll with it and you get the harvest that you get i am admittedly very laid back when it comes to a lot of this stuff um, i do everything that i can but i i garden in part uh, for my own peace, my own mental well-being. And so I don't want to turn this into a source of a ton of stress. So I'm, I'm okay if my plants don't look perfect. I'm okay if my fruit doesn't look perfect. It's more important to me that it is organic and that it's naturally grown and that it's not covered in chemicals than for it to look pristine. Now I've been amazed up until this point at how pristine the plants out here in the high tunnel have looked because being able to keep the rain off of them definitely made a difference. But I started noticing some of these issues about a week ago and started doing some preventative stuff, but I'm, I think I'm gonna take it up another step. One of the main things I have going on out here right now is flea beetles, which flea beetles are these tiny little black um, beetles. They jump uh, like fleas. And basically what they do is they'll decimate your leaves. They put all these tiny little holes in them and it gets to the point that the leaves dry up. They turn brown and brittle. And this is an example of like really bad flea beetle damage here. And I've got multiple places here in the high tunnel, all on lower leaves that have pretty extensive flea beetle damage. And I'm just taking these branches off the plant. I'm throwing them in a pile out front and then I'm gonna take that and put it on the burn pile when I'm done here. One time I was visiting Baker Creek and they were dealing with some persistent pest, I think it was aphids, in their, their high tunnels. And they had come up with like basically this backpack sprayer that it honestly kind of looked like a Ghostbusters get up. And they were just like bombing their uh, high tunnel with diatomaceous earth and just spraying diatomaceous earth all over the plants. Now, I don't have anything like that or anything that I can really rig like that, but I do want to put diatomaceous earth all on these plants. Now, how I'm going to effectively just get it all over the place, I mean, I'm just going to have to do my best um, on all of these because that is going to be a lot. But beetles being hard bodied, diatomaceous earth basically. Uh, breaks them down and so that's kind of what i'm looking at on here is i'm going to try to to combat this with diatomaceous earth because they are doing a pretty substantial amount of damage i've actually dealt with flea beetles extensively with eggplants but i've never had extensive flea beetle damage on tomatoes so this is new to me they're leaving the peppers alone but several of the tomato plants have them now another thing that i'm seeing out here and this is only on a handful of plants do you see these little black spots 
This is called bacterial speck. And you can see it's on these leaves as well. However, it, there's no spots on the stems at all. Bacterial speck is something that my tomatoes get um, about, I mean, just every year we get this, it comes up. Um, not all the plants get it. Some, some are more prone to it. I don't know if it's a variety thing, but like this one plant, there's multiple of this variety here and only this one has it. It is not fatal to the plant and it does not make your fruit inedible. What I've done in the past when I have some plants that have something like this, and basically it just blemishes the fruit and the leaves. It doesn't keep the plant from growing and it's really caused uh, likely from the humidity that we have. I mean, our days are often 90 plus percent humidity and that just can cause fungal infection even whenever you're doing a lot of pruning. And so what I personally do, because when you're canning, you really wanna use blemish-free fruit. You wanna make sure that it's just as healthy as possible. And so when I have plants that end up getting something like this bacterial speck, or they have a lot of blemishes on them for, from this sort of thing, that's what we use for fresh eating, or I'll make salsa with it and you know not can it, just what we're gonna eat fresh in the house. And I try to save my more pristine fruits for the ones that I'm gonna be putting in jars. And anytime that I'm dealing with sickness, I'll try to use like a separate set of pruners to prune these plants or whatever, but I'll, I'll clip off, I've already done it here. I've clipped off the lower leaves that had a lot of spots on them. Those fruits still have spots on them. But uh, so far the plants around it are not really showing up with much of that. Now, if I end up with plants that the whole plant starts looking really sick, like wilting really hard, the whole plant starts like turning yellow, um, those, those obviously fatal, diseases, um, I tear that plant out quick and burn it and just get it away from the other plants because those things can be contagious. Now, I don't know every sickness and every disease of every plant in the garden. Um, even tomatoes, which I love to grow, I really can only diagnose what I have personally dealt with. And so sometimes I'll have something come up and be like, hmm, I have no idea what that is. And the way that I deal with that is truly just Googling it and looking through images until I find something that I feel like, okay, that looks like what I'm dealing with. There is a website that I have had bookmarked for a while and I just like, I check it a lot and it's Cornell University has put up this vegetable MD online. I'll put a link to it down below. But like they have this page where it's like tomato disease identification key by affected plant part. And you can literally go through and click and see pictures of each thing. Um, basically, if it's got issues on like the top and the shoulder, the stem end, like the blossom end, the calyx to the blossom end, the entire fruit. And basically, you are able to look through this and diagnose what's going on with your plant. And then once you have the name of it, for instance, so it's like that bacterial speck. It's really simple to do a search of like what to do for a bacterial speck in tomatoes. And you will find out, is this fatal? Is this something that needs to be torn out and burned immediately? Is this something that I can manage with a product, with pruning or whatever? And the thing is, is I mean, this particular website has something like 60 issues listed. And some of those are gonna be regional. Like I'm going to deal with issues here in the humid, hot South that those of you who are growing in a really dry climate are not gonna deal with. So while it's really beneficial to find like YouTube channels of people who are growing in your area, they still might not be able to show you those issues. They, they might be able to tell you about them, but uh, having a resource like that that you can look things up by picture is really, really helpful. All right, let's come down here to something I saw. Check out that heartbreaker. This is blossom end rot, and I'm pulling these off. Blossom end rot is a very common and very heartbreaking uh, tomato affliction, and it's caused by Essentially, a lack of calcium is a simplification of what causes blossom and rot. Now, a lot of people will tell you to add calcium to your soil, either by like Tums or some other additive. Um, a lot of people say putting garden lime in your soil will help, and I actually did that. All of my plants were planted with a little bit of garden lime this year. Um, blossom and rot is often caused by like watering issues namely too much water because essentially if you're overwatering your plants are not able to absorb the calcium that they need. In my experience, when you really do have a calcium deficiency, you'll have blossom and rot all year. Um, 
in that's when you really need to address like calcium in your soil and imbalance that would cause those plants from not being able to absorb it. It's pretty common to have blossom and rot on some of your first fruits and then it goes away and the the rest of your fruits will be fine. And I'm assuming that's probably what's going on here because I actually, a lot of my plants do not have blossom and rot. Uh, probably at the end of this year, I'll do some soil testing and see if I need to do anything to try to even out my soil. But for the most part, when I see this, I try to go ahead and, and catch it young because this fruit's not going to be worth anything. Like I'm not gonna be able to eat this and I wanna go ahead and get them off the plant when I see that they have blossom and rot because I don't want that plant putting any focus in maturing this fruit. I want it to make new fruits that don't have blossom and rot and mature those instead so that I can eat them. So I just started looking through these plants in this bed and at first I thought the only ones that had blossom and rot were those thornburns terracotta. And a lot of times you'll see that. You'll see one variety struggle in whatever way. It might be more prone to whatever the problem is. And, you know, sometimes you just have to make a choice on whether or not that variety is worth the trouble to you. Because some heirlooms specifically, I mean, they can be more prone to issues. Uh, however, I started really looking and seeing that a lot of the plants in this bed in particular are having this issue of all different varieties. With it being so many different varieties, I've definitely got my alert on, like something may be going on right here. And because so often blossom and rot is caused by watering issues, it kind of has me thinking, well, our, our greenhouse is on a little bit of an incline. Maybe when I'm watering, this bed is somehow getting a lot more of that water and the, the, you know, the bed up at the top is not getting quite as much. So I'm gonna have to troubleshoot that. I'm gonna have to figure it out. Uh, there is a video by Gary over at the Rusted Garden, I'll link it down below, where he uses lime to treat blossom and right brought and I did put lime in on the beginning when I planted these so um, that might be something that I could try to like intervene with here I'm, I'm gonna keep an eye on this and try to figure out because one you, you know you can make a preventative measure to try to stop the problem with your fruit and that's good like we should do that so I'm gonna put that link down below so if you guys have this issue you can maybe jump in on that as well however don't stop there like if if you're trying to develop a garden, like look beyond the harvest of the year that you're currently gardening in and think, I also wanna to get to the root of the problem, find out what's going on with my soil here and amend that because if we have a healthy soil structure that can feed our plants properly, uh, then we can avoid this issue coming up at all in future years. I pulled out about 15 affected fruits off of this whole bed, different varieties. But a lot of them are fine, so it's not just like a huge issue. But I'll tell you what, when you see a tomato developing and then you turn it over and see that big black end on it and you're like, no, I wanted to eat you. Okay, last issue we're going to talk about today is blossom drop. So there is a tomato blossom that is dried up and falling off. There are quite a few of them on these plants doing that. So let's talk about why. Tomatoes are a summer crop and we are accustomed to growing them in our spring and summer gardens and eating them. They are so the taste of summer for so many people, myself included. Uh, but tomatoes actually don't like growing in super hot temperatures. Actually, they drop their blossoms when you are consistently having days that surpass about 90 to 95 degrees, which is about 32-ish degrees Celsius, 32, 34 degrees Celsius. And so there can be issues with growing tomatoes through the heat of the summer if you live in an area that's really hot. Uh, now, I've got all of these in this high tunnel. It has shade cloth, so it's actually cooler in here than it is outside. And actually, these tomatoes in here are setting more fruit than my tomato plants outside right now. Uh, this is just part of living where I live. Shade cloth can help that. I have some fans that I'm gonna set up out here that can keep the air moving and possibly keep it a little cooler. And that will address if there is an issue with pollination, tomato plants self-pollinate. And sometimes you'll see those blossoms dry up because they're not getting pollinated. That may be 
the issue here? I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Because tomatoes plants self-pollinate, they actually don't need insects to pollinate them. Uh, they just need to be moved, just like this, just like a good shake. The wind does whip through this high tunnel with the sides being up. And also when I'm coming out here and I am tying these plants up, what I'm doing is shaking them. Uh, if you are having issues with you're seeing a lot of blossoms but you're not seeing any fruit get set, and this can really be a problem if you live like in a neighborhood, lots of privacy fences and houses and basically wind blocks. And if you are seeing that, uh, move your plants around. I've seen people take like electric toothbrushes and go and like put it on the stem where the flowers are growing which vibrates it and makes sure that it pollinates. You can do that but I have always found that just kind of like shaking the plant pretty well does the job and that makes sure that they're pollinating. I don't think that's what's going on in here. I think that it's really the heat that's causing those blossoms to dry up and fall off. It could be. So I've, I've been making sure that today while I'm tie I was tying them up and doing some pruning that I was, that I was giving these plants a good shake. Each one of them making sure that they're getting some movement so that they are pollinating their blossoms. I actually spotted one more issue while I was talking, but it was an obvious one. That damage was caused by that guy. I haven't seen just a lot of what I would uh, assume is caterpillar damage out here at all. But I did spot a few things, all of which I was able to find the little guy that did it. However, it's probably getting to be about that time of year where I'm going to get out here with a black light and start searching for hornworms because that's something that we really deal with a lot here where I live. Tomato hornworms are those big green things that can decimate a tomato plant in about a day once they get full size. But if you get out with a black light and you search for them, you can find them when they're really small and cut off the life cycle and never have to deal with a lot of damage. So I always try to do that preventatively. So I just want to conclude this by saying that if you followed me for very long at all over the last few years I've always posted pictures of my kitchen table my big old kitchen table covered every inch of it covered in ripe tomatoes uh, baskets and buckets full of tomatoes from one harvest I've I've grown a lot of tomatoes very successfully over the last few years and every single year issues like this have been present in my garden. This is not even slightly alarming to me. This is like, okay, it's tomato season. This is part of it. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna address these issues. The ones that I can address to save the fruit now and fix now, I will do the things that I can do. Um, some of them are going to be things that I'm taking notes of and I'm learning for the future years because I wanna make my garden better year after year. But this is just part of the process and it's okay. So like, don't freak out and give up just because you're having to do some troubleshooting in your garden. Uh, one little suggestion with this, just from a standpoint of having been to the place of like overwhelm with it before, make sure you're handling stuff like this really early in the morning or in the evening. Like if you're having to come out and pick bugs and prune damage and all of that, do it in the hours where it's not as physically draining to you because if you're having to come out and deal with these gardening issues and you're trying to do it through the hottest part of the day um, you're making that job a lot harder on yourself than it has to be just do it in the evening or in the morning and kind of set your mind to understand that that this is part of the process you learn you learn how to prevent some things you learn how to catch them early to spot them before there's a whole lot of damage and you can be like kind of in an offensive stance rather than a defensive stance on your garden that's definitely the best way to do it but there are always going to be instances where you're having to play defense in your garden that just happens but today you know i'm i'm telling you here are the issues here are some of the possible solutions some of these don't really have solutions i'm just going to deal with them and i want to show you that so you know that even somebody who is gardening on youtube with a big following there are still issues in the garden it's not all like unicorns and rainbows and everything's just completely fine and we get all this beautiful harvest and it's you know we never break a sweat doing it that's not how it is at all i hope that helps you guys um it is getting to be kind of late in the morning and i want to go eat this tomato <laughs> thank you for hanging out with me this morning i bless you until next time